I'd like to first start by simply just asking, how did you become interested in gerontology? Okay, um, it's a kind of convoluted story. Um, I was a student, a graduate student, working on my master's in anthropology mm -hmm. at University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, and quite honestly, I thought I was going to go into um, linguistics, anthropological linguistics. I had done um, field work in St. Lucia um, on bilingualism and cognition, and I just thought, oh, this is what I want to do. Um, and then, you know, after spending time in St. Lucia, and this was way back, this was 1975, mm -hmm. um, so it was before tourism really made its mark in that island, um, and it's a very impoverished third world country. Um, you know, and after seeing that, I thought, you know, um, Linguistics was really interesting, but I don't think, I mean, there's a lot of need out there um, that I can address that I wouldn't be doing in linguistics. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I, I really want to do something that will, you know, contribute to the welfare of the human good. I mean, I, I know I sound like a beauty pageant or something, but I want to <laughs> help people. Um, so anyway, I returned to Mizzou, and uh, my roommate told me there was this research project going on in the sociology department. Um, and it was being conducted by Dr. Robert Hobenstein. It was funded by the AOA, Administration on Aging, and it was this huge project to study aging in eight towns in Missouri. And so I thought, well, this will be a really good opportunity for me to get experience doing interviews. You know, so I really went into it thinking methodology. You know, mm -hmm. this okay. will help my methodological skills. And so then, you know, I started doing these interviews. They were in-depth interviews that took like two or three hours. So I mean, really got involved in the people mm -hmm. that I was interviewing. And it was just so fascinating. I mean, it was just, it, it lured me in, you know, and I just knew after doing about a, I mean, I ended up doing, I'm sure, several hundred interviews. Um, both in Columbia and then in this little small town called Calio, Missouri. Um, but I mean, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I mm -hmm. mean, I just, it clicked, you know, and I was very fortunate to, to find, I mean, it addressed so many issues that I was looking for in a career. You know, I wanted, as I said, to do something socially useful, um, intellectually challenging. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in interdisciplinary kinds of work. Um, and I mean, I just really liked the people that I was working with. I, w I was just so fortunate to be at Mizzou at that time, mm -hmm. because unbeknownst to me, you know, at that time it was a real center for aging. There was a center for aging studies. Um, they had the AOA fellowships, so I got one of those, which you know helped me onto my career. And people like Robert Hobenstein, um, Don Kogel, you know, who wrote Modernization and mm -hmm. Aging. I took my intro course from him. Um, Donald Kausler, who's like a major person in cognition and aging. I took my cognition and aging course from him. I mean, all these really wonderful people. And they had a, a number of postdocs. And, um, you know, I, I did pretty well in that project. So Robert Hovenstein asked mm -hmm. me to continue on as one of his, you know, research assistants. And um, that's how I met my husband, oh, you know, because nice. he was one of the other research assistants. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I can still remember, you know, I was, we were in this office, you know, being interviewed, and he was over here, I was there. Um, that's how we met. And so, um, yeah, and there were postdocs, and they would, Hobby, Robert Hobbinstein went by Hobby. Mm -hmm. You know, he just gave us total access to everything. You know, he, I mean, we worked really, really hard for him. I mean, we read everything. You know, he was really a major, he was coming from the Chicago School of sociology, so a major person in qualitative methods. He had written a major methodology book, uh, but we read everything on qualitative methods. We read everything, you know, back then you could read everything on aging. You know, it was, I mean, you'd be crazy to try to do that now, yeah. but I mean, we really mastered the field. Um, you know, and in return, and also, I mean, he had us like cleaning his house for his parties, and he would sell oriental rugs on the side, and we'd go help him with that. I mean, we were, you know, like his, 
at his beck and call. But in return, you know, like we could just go through everything in his office and he said, oh, I'm reviewing these grant proposals. Look at these. Uh -huh. You know, and that's how we learned how to write grants. Wow. You know, we read all these people's grant proposals and, um, you know, he let us go to all the talks um, that the postdocs were going to. I mean, he treated us like postdocs. Wow. You know, so it was really cool. Sounds like a really engaging yeah. experience. Yeah, it was exciting. And then we both um, were doing our master's thesis, and um, there was this continuing care retirement community called Lenore, which was just a few miles outside of Mizzou, Columbia. And it was one of the very first CCRCs in the country. Mm -hmm. It was started in 1949. Um, and so David and I decided we were going to do a study of that. So, I mean, we did an eth ethnographic study of the CCRCs, which was one of the very first done at that time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I, I did my focus on socialization um, into residency of a CCRC, and he did his on, you know, local versus non-local residents who move into this thing. And so we had our interviews, we interviewed 50 residents, and those interviews were like three hours long. Wow. Um, so my thesis was that's like a, that's a big, big. Yeah, yeah. So my, ad, yeah, okay. So anyway, mm -hmm. we just, I, it was really fun. I'd yeah. like to ask with respect to this um, initial research project you're describing, where you had the opportunity to do so many interviews. I think you mentioned two to three hundred. What, um, if it's possible to say, um, it was. It sounded like your entry point, kind of into the aging. Absolutely. What was it that you were being exposed to in those interviews? That it sounds like it was a transformational experience. That kind it of really was. Changed yeah. Your mind about yeah. Like, well, remember, this is hard to bring back. This was back in 1976. Um, I don't know. It was just the the interview itself was so multidimensional. You know, you would get into every aspect of the person's lives, even you know, like their funeral plans. You know, and, and it, it was just so fascinating to um, kind of step into the world of someone else. And they were so generous. You know, they just like opened up mm -hmm. and gave me all this information. And, uh, you know, it was just, it, it fascinated me. I just wanted to know as much as possible. And it, I, as I said, it just clicked. And I don't know if I can say one specific thing, but I do remember one of the very first interviews that I did was in Calio, Missouri, small town. It was like a town of 300 people. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself was, you know, I'd go there for the weekend and, you know, like, I would love to do an ethnography of Calio. Um, but the, after that first interview, the woman said, oh, I feel like I've known you all my life. You know, and I kind of felt the same way, wow. you know. So it was just such a... Um, an enriching experience, mm -hmm. you know, to enter into people's lives like that. Um, and the people were generous enough to do that. So I knew I really loved interviewing, you know, because of that. And then it just, the subject matter was intrinsically fascinating mm -hmm. to me. So at what point would you say um, you began to identify as a gerontologist in kind of your career? That's right? an interesting question because at the time it was debate really being debated whether gerontology was a field. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I took every aging course I could at Mizzou, and then there was nothing left for me to do. So I had decided to transfer to University of California, San Francisco, and get a degree in human development mm -hmm. and aging. You know, and then, you know, like Don Kogel would say, you know, there is no gerontology, you know, and like David and I are going, oh. <laughs> You know, because it was really debated, you know, like, is this a separate field or should it just be infused in all these traditional uh -huh. disciplines? You know, and to me, I was more, I mean, I was interested in anthropology, but I was more interested in aging, you know, so that's what I wanted to do, no matter what Don Kogel told mm -hmm. me, you know, and, and <laughs> kind of disregarding career possibilities because, you know, the structures of universities are such that they're not that receptive to a degree, interdisciplinary degree, at least back then. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, I identified very early with the fields against okay. the better judgment of my mentors. <laughs> okay. 
And then, so can you uh, explain more about how that played out once you moved uh, to California and continued on with your doctorate? Oh your my specialization God! Specialization there. It was so. I mean, it was just. I went from one really good center for aging to like the mecca of aging. All the really major people were mm -hmm. there, you know. And I just put all my eggs in one basket. You know, I only applied to this program. They only took five people, um, but. You know, I really, really admired the work of Irv Rossow and Margaret Clark, and they were both there. Um, and then, you know, getting there and meeting people like Carol Estes and, you know, Colleen Johnson, Corin Neidegger, Len Perlin, Christy Kiefer, Dave Chiraboga. You know, I mean, these really people, top of the field, you know. Um, so. And it, it was funny because the people at Missouri said, tried to keep, you know, tried to dissuade me. And Hobby said, I mean, this is, uh, David and I still quote him saying this, um, you think you'll find new gods, but you won't. Um, <laughs> you know, and like, oh, yeah, right. There is no generosity. You're not going to find new gods. Um, but I mean, I just wanted to go to University of California, San Francisco, so badly, and I, I felt bad because I, you know, was very, very um, tied to Mizzou and Hobby and Don Kogel, and in fact, we continued to keep up with Hobby, um, and even after he retired, you know, we'd go to his retirement, her, his birthday parties. They'd have them like every five years, so um, you know, we saw him even when he was living at Tiger Place. Um, which is um, another really interesting place at Mizzou for aging. That's like a kind of a, a smart environment, residential care for older adults. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, being at, at University of California, San Francisco was such a great opportunity. And, you know, I just totally focused on that. And then I had a chance to get involved in research there also. Um, so I got into a project as a research assistant um, being run by Joe Barbaccia and Eleanor Lurie, and it was on um, discharge planning um, and for persons with hip replacements and hip fractures and cardiovascular um, issues for all older adults. Okay. Um, you know, and what were the factors that predicted short-term outcome for those people? So I was really involved in that and, and learned a lot about, you know, on the medical side. You know, I had to do a lot of chart <laughs> reviews and everything. and. Um, it was really pretty neat because, I mean, Joe Barbaccia treated us like medical students and then mm -hmm. at the end he said, you know, you, you are comparable to medical students in terms of what you know, you know, about cardiology mm -hmm. and hips. Um, so, you know, that was good. We, it really fleshed out a whole component of my background that I hadn't had mm -hmm. before. And the anthropology piece was um, also applied throughout that process. I, is it true that um, part of your training in the doctoral program was kind of a medical anthropology perspective? Yeah, or? right, yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. My, I was officially in the Human Development and Aging program, mm -hmm. which no longer exists, unfortunately. But, you know, the boundaries were very fluid. So I was spending a lot of time in medanthro, and that was like the hot spot for medical anthropology. You know, Margaret Clark started anthropology of aging. You know, so, you know, I took her courses, um, you know, worked with those people, got to know Gabe Becker and mm -hmm. Sharon Kaufman. They were students at the time. Um, you know, and Gabe would give me all sorts of advice. Um, yeah, so I had the benefits. I just took as much advantage of that university yeah. as I could, you know, and, and Carol Estes was in sociology, but I still took her course. Mm -hmm. I sat in on Anselm Strauss's qualitative methods course. I mean, it was just like, I was almost like this sponge, you know, it's like all this stuff, you know, I want to know, I want to yeah, know. Yeah, sounds yeah. great. So then it was. can you talk a little bit more about some of the other major milestones that have brought you to where you are today? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Immediately, I mean, as when I was still a student, um, I had an opportunity to work with Christine Fry, who was mm -hmm. the major person in anthropology of aging. She and Jenny Keith um, had gotten a, a major grant from NIH to do this cross cultural study of aging. And so I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I could be a research assistant on this project. So, um, 
you know, I talked to Irv Rossell about it. He's my mentor. And, you know, he says, well, usually I don't, you know, I stand back and I let students make their own decisions. And then he said, but first of all, you're going to do what you want anyway. Um, <laughs> but then he said, you know, I really encourage you to do this. You know, even though I, I still had my dissertation to do, and I was leaving San Francisco, which in hindsight might not have been, you know, it, it's, it's really hard to write a dissertation when you're not in your milieu of, of studenthood. Um, but I was, I really wanted to be involved in this project. So, you know, there's Charlotte Eichels was doing work in Hong Kong. Jenny was doing work in, in the U.S. Um, community, like suburban community. And then I ended up being in the U.S. rural community, Moments, Illinois. So in a way, Calio, Missouri prepared me for Moments, uh -huh. Illinois, because Moments <laughs> was big compared to Calio, but it was still a very small town. Um, and I lived literally in the research office. You know, I mean, it was my my little bedroom and kitchen, and then the research office, like uh -huh. in the front, and it was above a paint store. You know, and oh my God, my dad would just like lay awake at night, saying, "Oh, this thing is going to go up in flames." Because I mean, these people, they would hold barbecues within their paint store, you know, and like I couldn't breathe, and oh it was like, "Oh my God, we're, I, how long will I be here?" But um, <laughs> anyway, that was a really interesting experience, and again, I got out and interviewed lots of people and saw a whole different, um, you know, it was a different culture unto mm -hmm. itself. You know, and just seeing the issues that arose in working in cross-cultural work. Um, so I did that for about a year, and then I moved to Chicago, and I was teaching kind of part-time at Loyola, mm -hmm. and finishing up my dissertation, which ended up being um, an ethno ethnography of a senior center, oh. you know, and how people were socialized to the role of volunteer within that. And that was an interesting thing, because at the time, um, you know, David was there in Chicago. He was working for a place called CETA, Community and Economic Development Association, mm -hmm. which was run by an anthropologist, which is like so unusual, you know, um, back then. Um, you know, and it was a very international group. Um, but anyway, this anthropologist had worked on this study, very famous study in, in Latin America, um, you know, with the Cornell people, like empowering the Vicos Project which was, you know, this project empowering na native inhabitants of this place, you know, to, to fend for themselves, you know, and it was very community development oriented. That's, Dave, my husband's um, degree is in community development and by osmosis, I kind of have that degree too. So the whole issue of empowerment um, was really important and that's what they did at the center was mm -hmm. empower the participants to run it themselves, you know, so they would like make decisions in terms of who would be the 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 for source of food for their nutrition program. Mm -hmm. You know, they were you know very much involved. So it was very interesting to see, you know, how were they socialized to that kind of role, um, you know, and they they just welcomed me. They said, you know, you have to like like write all these notes because nobody's going to believe that you've spent so much time in the senior <laughs> center because I mean I was there like all the time yeah. you know and you know we were getting ready to get married and you know they wanted to know all about it they would tell me music that we should play in the wedding I mean it was it was you know like my little group of pals mm -hmm. so then after that um, there was an opportunity to um, and and I did write that up and, and actually got um, an award, NCOA award um, on, for that. Um, so then I moved, we moved to Kansas City because there was an opportunity for, to be a visiting professor for okay. three years. Um, so I did a lot of teaching, put together a lot of courses. You know, and also in Chicago, I was teaching at Loyola and at this place called George Williams College. So I did, I put together and, and taught a vast array of subjects, you know, like human origins, which really was not my area. You know, I mean, I was like learning this as I went, you know, like Australopithecus and all that. And, and it's a field that changes, moves a lot. So, you know, the teaching stuff was really challenging. It sounds like a time of broadening. It was, yeah. And, and I was in a lot of different departments. 
Um, but as I said, I, I found the interdisciplinary stuff interesting. So at that time, um, I got a grant. You know, when I was in Illinois, I got a grant from Illinois um, Department on Aging mm -hmm. to do that research in the um, senior center. In Kansas City, I got a grant from the Missouri Alzheimer's Group, um, which again was very innovative. The governor's wife um, was really an advocate of, of Alzheimer's, because I think one of her parents had it. Mm -hmm. So they had funding for Alzheimer's research on a state level. Back then, that was pretty unusual. So I got one of the grants, and that was um, to study um, a continuing care retirement community. This time it was John Knox uh, Village, which at the time was the largest continuing care retirement community in the country. Um, so I was studying how did people learn, was there a culture of caregiving within mm -hmm. that, and how did people get involved in mm -hmm. that care? And, and really got more involved in dementia research, which I hadn't up to that point. Um, so then, and, and caregiving research, uh -huh. you know, and so then the opportunity came um, to move to Philadelphia and work at the Philadelphia Geriatric Center, which again, another mecca for gerontologists. Yes. It was so exciting. So they hired me to be um, the program project director. You know, so there was this huge program project being funded by NIMH on mm. mental health and caregiving. And there were three sub-programs within that. One was run by Powell, um, and that was on the, the tra trajectory of, of caregiving, kind of like caregiving career. One was run by Elaine Brody, and um, oh gosh, she was looking at um, you know, just the juggling of multiple roles and that kind of thing. And then the other was run by P Rachel Perchno, and mm -hmm. she was looking at three generational households and how caregiving dynamics um, happened. So, you know, there was an, a lot of overlap in terms of getting the sample and the interviews and everything. Mm -hmm. And so I was coordinating this massive project. Yeah. So, I mean, that took up a lot of my time. And PGC was so exciting, you know. and. I mean, it was, at that time, it was like the greatest concentration of anthropologists in aging. Mm -hmm. You know, there was Bob Rubenstein, Mark Laborski, Steve Albert, myself, um, Athena, McLean, um, you know, and various other people that came and went. So, I mean, it was exciting. But then also very interdisciplinary. There were sociologists and social workers and clinical psychologists. So it was really a neat time. And I was around a lot of people who just were so into what they were doing mm -hmm. and very, very skilled in writing grants yeah, and doing very research. With a lot of yeah. resources and, you know, like every day at lunch, you know, Alan Glicksman would get, her, get up, go around, say, okay, it's lunchtime, it's lunchtime. So we go, okay. So everybody dropped everything. And our offices were literally in the independent living building, you know, uh -huh. so we were with residents were like down the hall from us um, but then you know we would go down and we'd walk to the nursing home and eat lunch in the cafeteria there so I mean everybody ate lunch together uh -huh. every day Powell was there and and everybody and you know I mean down to like the student intern you know and everybody was an equal and everybody just shared what they were doing mm -hmm. and you know it was such a really supportive and intellectually yeah. exciting place. Yeah. When I was at PGC, I developed skills that had started with Robert Hobenstein in, oh. in writing grants. I mean, Hobby, David and I wrote grant, uh, a grant, I mean, just to backtrack a little, for one of Hobby's courses, we wrote, you know, grant proposals for this study, you know, for our master's thesis. And Hobby would take these things, like, and show them to everybody. Like, Bruce Biddle was like this mega social psychology person. He goes, you've created little monsters. <laughs> you know, and David to this day keeps saying, we're little monsters. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so I developed my skills further in writing grants and was pretty successful in getting a career award from NIA and um, several grants from AARP, mm -hmm. Andrus Foundation. You know, and that research was in caregiving, different aspects of caregiving. Um, so then, you know, for family reasons, um, you know, my father died, David's father died, our mothers 
were kind of like on their own. And so we decided, you know, we had been going back and forth from Philadelphia to St. Louis so many times, and it was exhausting and never knowing what was happening. So it was a very hard decision to leave PGC, mm -hmm. really hard. Um, but, you know, we decided, you know, our mothers are our priority. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, you know, probably, you know, career-wise, that probably wasn't the best step for us. But just personally, I, I don't regret it mm -hmm. at all. You know, it was very important. So, you know, we just went, moved out back there. You know, I had grown up there, but I mean, I left right after the end of high school. I was out the door. Um, you know, so anyway, I sent my resume. I knew one person at Washington U and one person at St. Louis University. Mm -hmm. And so I sent my resumes to those two people and they circulated it around and I had some job interviews and I ended up, um, you know, on the faculty at, in the occupational therapy department at WashU, which, you know, was like totally new field for me. Um, but, you know, I, quite honestly, and now more and more anthropologists are becoming faculty members in OT departments. It's not too unusual. Um, yeah. And to me, it's very much like applied anthro. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just you're using, I mean, it, it, I, I like the conceptual framework of it, you know, because they're looking at, at the holistic situation, not just a medical model of looking at the person and their deficits, but looking at a person, how they interact with their environment and what it is that they're trying to do mm -hmm. in terms of their occupation, which throws everyone. It's that what's meaningful activity for you is, an, is what occupation is to an occupational therapist. So it's the con configuration of all those three things. So it's not just if you want to address if a person can't do the activity that they want to do, it's not, you don't have to just totally focus on, oh, you know, get them stronger glasses or, you know, they're doomed if they have dementia. You, you can supplement the environment so it's more supportive, you know, to enable them to do what they want to do or, you know, adjust the activity so that it's more doable, you know, and they, they rely heavily on Powell Lawton's theories of environment and aging. Um, so, I mean, that was a totally good fit, you know, unbeknownst to me, you know. And so then, again, it was like the more and more I learned about occupational therapy, the more I liked it. Um, so, you know, I was in that department for a while, you know, and then also kind of affiliated with the psychology department and the anthropology department. Mm -hmm. um, I got several more grants, um, you know, from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and then I had the opportunity to um, join the faculty at um, St. Louis University, so I switched over there. And this yeah. is where you are now? Well, I, I recently left there, um, and right now, uh, you know, it's a complicated story, but right now I'm kind of um, in a new phase, which is really given me a lot of freedom to do what I want to do. Um, so now I can do a lot of the international work um, mm -hmm. that was very, really hard to do, you know, in a traditional faculty position. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of work in Guatemala. And in fact, you know, the OT connection, um, it's a long story about how the, all this developed, but I was one of the founders of the um, NAPA. NAPA is the National Association for the Practice of Anthropology. Mm -hmm slash OT field school in Antigua, Guatemala. It's the only field school that is based in the American Anthropological Association, so it's pretty, really a big deal. And it's been going on now for years. So I helped to develop that, and, and for years I was head of the gerontology component. Mm -hmm. you know, and we would bring in anthropology and occupational therapy graduate students. You know, and just like give them this international experience for six weeks, they would take courses in Spanish, but also, you know, learn a lot about the culture and history of Guatemala, and then, you know, work, um, divide up into the different components. So I had, you know, my students, anthro and occupational therapy students, and we were based in Casa Maria, which is a hogar of, of a home mm -hmm. for older adults. And the anthropologists would, like, 
do an ethnographic study of the place and interview people. And then they would give this information to the occupational therapy students who would then develop individualized programs for residents and group programs. I mean, it was phenomenal. I mean, just to see, you know, David came down and he saw it at the beginning and he saw it at the end and he couldn't believe it. You know, the transformation both in the students and, you know, in the work. Um, I mean, we had this one woman never came out of her room, you know, and after working with the students, I mean, she was like going around, she was saying, I can teach the exercise program when you leave. You know, and then, you know, she was introducing herself to everybody, you know, and saying, I can do this, you know. So, I mean, it was really exciting to see that transformation. So that, and then also just recently, um, David was invited to um, help develop a continuing care retirement community in China for 7,000 wow. people. So this past year, uh, we spent a number of months living in China mm -hmm. and working on this CCRC, which was fascinating. I mean, it was very such different cultural context. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. And, and it was very intense. I mean, we were working seven days a week, wow. you know, getting the, we, I mean, we lived in an apartment, but it was real close. So, and, and the intent was to actually move into the community once it was done. Um, so we had really close relationships with the people who worked there and, you know, it, it learned a lot. And I think we made some good contributions. His role was to develop the whole system of operations, um, you know, for the continuing care, you know, like put together all sorts of um, guidelines mm -hmm. and, and everything. So it was a really, really major work. And then I kind of assumed this role, as I said, everybody was from a hotel background and knew nothing about aging. Uh -huh. So I decided to teach gerontology 101. So I had a class like once a week for an hour at night and everybody came to it. It was like housekeeping and security uh -huh. and maintenance and kitchen people and administration people. I mean, the whole gamut. So, I mean, it was an audience as diverse as you can possibly imagine. Um, but I mean, the Chinese, I mean, it's, it's, you can't really generalize to a whole culture, but I mean, there's a reason that Asian students are like so ahead of the game. I mean, there was this work ethic that was unbelievable and this just desire to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they were, I was, and I did not dumb down that course. You know, I had it, and I had a translator, so we had slides, and it was in English and Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I'd started off with demography of aging in China, you know, and I mean, it was like, you know, like, totally new stuff. Everyone was going, what? You know, and they really? had no idea. And I said, yes, and that's why what you're doing is so important, you know, because yeah. there's this huge need, you know, and, and you've got to make this thing work, you know. So here's all this information about aging to help you, you know, do your job better, mm -hmm. you know. And so that was my intent, was to give them, you know, the research findings on you know, like the whole array, physical aging, cognitive aging, changes in sensors, senses, you know, and environment and aging. Um, give them that information, but then help to think, how can you use this on your job? How can you as a security guard use all this information about falls and fall prevention? You know, I mean, these guys were out in the parking lot, you know, helping people get in and out of cars. You know, so, I mean, I tried to underscore to each person, you know, this is how you can use this job. Mm -hmm. You can help that person get out of the car safely if you know how to do it correctly. You know, so, you know, people were very appreciative. And, I mean, it was fun. The housekeeping people just thought this was the greatest. <laughs> you know, during the day, yeah. I'd see them, and they'd go, oh, Dr. Perkins said hi, you know. <laughs> ni hao, ni hao. Ni hao <laughs> yeah, so that was really <laughs> cool. And then we came back, and... Um, you know, David ended up having to have a hip replacement, so you can't fly for half a year. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of cut, I mean, we, we basically finished what we needed to do there, although we had intended to be there longer and live there, and I really wanted to live there when the residents came. Uh -huh. That would have been fascinating. So we're kind of like a, on a holding pattern. You know, we're working with this woman, Min Cole, um, who is originally from China, but she lives in Los Angeles now. And she has her own company and, 
has, she's worked in aging in China for a long time, has a lot of connections, and so she's seeing what other projects we can get involved in. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what develops. Yeah. You know, and in the meantime, I want to continue my research. I mean, I'm still associated with the field school, but then I went on to do my own research in Guatemala, and that's a participatory action research on aging. Um, you know, which is a whole other thing. And if you're concerned about time, I won't get into it, but okay. that is really exciting too. Um, so we want to continue doing that. And, you know, we're sponsoring um, children in three different families down there. So, you know, we ha they're kind of like our quasi-grandchildren. Yeah. So, you know, we have been involved in their lives for the past seven years, wow. you know, and so we'll keep going down. And uh, yeah. the Journal of Cross-Cultural Gerontology. Uh -huh. So now I can devote a lot more time to that because okay. it was really, that is, being an editor of an international peer-reviewed journal is, you know, a job unto itself. So it's good that I can now devote more time to those manuscripts. And, you know, I've got contacts all over the place and people are, inviting me to come, you know, and speak and everything. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a way, it, it's it's exciting to have, you know, it, it's like, I don't know where I'm going next, but I have the freedom to do whatever I want to do, and I have a lot of contacts that will allow me to do so. So, you know, I have one contact. Well, we'll see what happens, but there's other possibilities in China, too. Yeah, so that's a continuing um, yeah. opportunity. Yeah. So, um, one of the aims also of the Wiggle Project is to understand um, the experience of women in gerontology. And I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, some of your experiences with female mentors who have um, impacted your experience in gerontology, and then also just with attention to what is unique about being a woman gerontologist. Okay. Well, if you were interviewing a younger person, you'd probably get very different responses. Because remember, I've when I was in college, it was like late 60s, early 70s. It was just the beginning of the women's mm -hmm. movement. So, you know, I felt, you know, like breaking the ground in a lot of ways. There just weren't that many women. I mean, all my major mentors were men, you know, and they were phenomenally generous and kind and brilliant men. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Hobenstein, Dr. Hobenstein, Dr. Kogel, at, and in my undergraduate work, um, I was at St. Mary's of Notre Dame, but it was when they almost merged with Notre Dame, so I was taking all my courses at Notre Dame. So Erwin Press there, you know, was a phenomenal mentor. Um, yeah, of course, Powell Lawton was a big mentor. Mm -hmm. You know, so those were the major people. And then, of course, all my colleagues at, in Aki especially, have helped to mentor. You know, one person who really was a good mentor for me, um, you know, and really the person who got me into Aki was Linda Breitsbrock. You know, she was, uh, I mean, she was so into Aki, and that was when I was at University of Missouri, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. um, so she kind of got us, both David and myself, involved like in local arrangements and then we just got more and more involved in mm -hmm. Aggie. So she was a good mentor in that regard. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with people, but the women that I worked with, um, you know, just, they were like the real pioneers. Chris Fry, as I said, was, you know, one of the major first people doing cross-cultural work. You know, Helena Lapata actually was a, a mentor, a good mentor for me when I was at Loyola. But these are women who, you know, it was very hard to be a major woman back then. You know, you had to, kind of, I mean, I, I don't know how, how to say it in a, a polite way, but I mean, you had to be tough, you know. And so, actually, you know, the men were like, almost more generative than the women because, you know, these women had to put on this, you know, they had to, they forged the way for us, mm -hmm. you know, and we're all internally grateful for that. But, you know, they had their hands full doing that. So, um, you know, I could, as, as from a distance, I could see what they're doing and try to um, model myself in certain ways mm -hmm. um, in that regard. But I have to say, my most important mentors were men. Okay. 
um, you know, and then being unique as a woman was just facing all that, all those barriers, you know, even, well, even now, I think it's, it's harder for women. Um, as a gerontologist, I think, you know, perhaps women are maybe more attuned to some of the issues like caregiving, um, but, you know, there are a lot of men who are attuned to those issues too. So I think a certain type of person, no matter what their gender is, goes into gerontology. Um, and quite honestly, that's one of the lures of the field for me too. Mm -hmm. You know, I like um, the person who puts those issues to the fore in what they want to do. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is a very interesting question. I'd like to ask um, how being a gerontologist has interacted with your own personal aging process. Yeah, that is such a hard question. It's a big question. It is, it's huge. And I think this is probably where I'm gonna, uh, you know. <laughs> um, I mean, certainly, you know, just from the medical standpoint, you know, doing that research on discharge planning and mm -hmm. seeing these people, you know, I, I was mostly in the cardio stuff and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I'm changing my diet, I am exercising, I'll never smoke. You know, I mean, really, my whole lifestyle changed in California and it was easy to do that in California, you know. And so, I mean, to this day, we don't eat red meat, you know, that, that kind of thing, just basic health kinds of things, um, you know, are so important. But, you know, just in, per in terms of personal development, um, you know, I guess I, I look on life more, you know, within the frameworks of human development. And, and, and I can still remember this conversation. I had my roommate in San Francisco, um, Daphne. Her background, I mean, she was, her background was in home economics. You know, and, and she just, I really liked her, but we were so different. You know, and I still remember this one time she said, well, you know, do you have like a plan that you want to do? <laughs> and I go, yeah. And she goes, oh, you know and I mean? It was just like she was living day to day and a lot of people do that, you know, but I mean, I just had different goals and maybe being in human development made me think more carefully about, oh, you know, these are the stages that I will be going through and, you know, there will be this time of work, there will be this time of maybe retirement plus work, you know, how, how do I want to coordinate all of this? Um, and I have to say, I mean, this sounds kind of weird probably, but um, Eric Erickson, who also was at University of California in San Francisco when I was there, and in fact, Helen Kivnick was there, um, I worked as Helen's research assistant for her dissertation. And Eric Erickson was a mentor on that project, an advisor for that project. Um, so yeah, Helen and I go back a long way. But you know, his, his whole framework, you know, of, of, you know, like in adulthood, you go through these stages, like you develop your identity, you develop your capacity to love and, and you know, have intimate relationships, you develop your capacity to be generative. Um, then you come to this, you know, enlightenment stage where you integrate it all together. And, you know, if you read him carefully, all of those things are in, in a dynamic throughout your life, right. but some things come to the fore more in so in different stages. You know, and I have to say, that probably has influenced how I think about my life. You know, I think, well, you know, here I am, generativity stage, you know, so we're helping these people in Guatemala, the children, um, you know, and, and trying to be a mentor to students. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that's probably how gerontology has, and of course it's put me into contact with so many phenomenal people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I mean, just my best friends are in this field. It's a field that I really love. And when I talk to students, I just, I, I tell them a little bit about, I don't know, for some reason they'd always pick me to give this talk to the OT students about career development. You know, and I just would say, well, this is what I looked for in a career. You know, and you have to sit down and think about what is it you want out of your work and mm -hmm. out of your life, and then what's gonna give it to you. And then, you know, it, for me, it just 
clicked, as I said, you know, from the very beginning. So if it's something, you know, you need to look for that, just that when everything comes together, mm -hmm. you know, and I would say students, I, I really, whatever it is for you, I hope you have that same experience.